Okay, well, thank you everybody for uh, tuning in. This is our uh, first live Google Hangout uh, hosted by Ken Krogh. This is Gabe Villamizar. I'm here, a, a social media strategist at InsightSales.com. And uh, feel free to ask questions uh, with uh, our hashtag Ken's Hangout um, via Twitter, Facebook, uh, at the event page itself, or uh, on YouTube if you're watching this uh, via YouTube. So to start out, let's uh, let's jump in it. Uh, we have here uh, with us Steve Richard, co-founder of uh, Boresight. Uh, we're gonna we're, we're so happy that you're here with us, Steve. And um, moving on, and we got here uh, Ralph Van Sosen. He is uh, the head of marketing for Sales Solutions at LinkedIn. Thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us. And uh, last but not least, we have here president and founder of uh, InsightSales.com, Ken Krogh. So um, yeah, Ken, let's take it away. Thanks, Gabe. Appreciate it. We're, we're pretty excited today. We really feel this Google Hangout venue is going to give us an opportunity to you know, pave some new ground. We had some fun things happen the last two days um, and over the last two weeks, actually. We wanted to tell you about it real quick. Uh, we had a webinar last, let's see, week, week and a half ago, Steve, was it about? I believe it was, yes. And uh, our, our topic was, uh, let me get, it was the science of using LinkedIn technology and social selling for cold calling. And we really raised the fuss out there. We, we had some folks who, who got quite concerned that we even used the name LinkedIn in the same sentence with cold calling. And... Uh, so we wanted to get the, the master of, of, of cold calling technology himself, Ralph Van Sosen. Now, Ralph, you head up the actual marketing for the Sales Navigator product for LinkedIn. Is that right? That's right, yeah. So my role is I head up marketing globally for the sales solutions business, and our flagship product is a Sales Navigator, and cold calling is our enemy. <laughs> That's awesome, and we're going to have some fun with it because uh, we uh, we stirred a bit of a hornet's nest, didn't we, Steve? That that was really interesting. But, so what we want to do is we want to just start talking about some of the issues that came up. the The first one itself is the concept of of cold calling, and um, I, I wanted to I wanted to start a little bit about defining cold calling, if we could, because. I think that's what causes most of the problem. When we say cold calling, it means lots of things to different people. And, and, and our friend Steve Masters, who wrote the blog, who was really concerned about cold calling, it might mean a little bit different than what we might have meant. But Ralph, to you and to LinkedIn, to define cold calling for us, would you? Well, we probably take a uh, you know a pretty aggressive uh, view in terms of the definition of cold calling. For us, uh, our, you know, cold call is something where you really don't have a previous uh, relationship or some type of context that you're going in warm. So, you know, we very much uh, look at it in terms of you you want to maximize the relationship that you have, something meaningful to say to to establish the relationship with them. So what it becomes it becomes a helpful outreach that really helps the buying process and makes it a great experience for the buyer rather than a, uh, you know, let me call aggressive move by, by a salesperson. Gotcha. I, I've got joining us uh, my partner in the webinar the other day, Steve uh, Richards from Boresight, and, and these guys make a living in the world of cold calling. Now, they've, they've raised it to a, an art and a science. Tell us, Steve, from your perspective, how do you define cold calling? So for me, <clears throat> I think of cold calling as making a connection with someone that you haven't previously before and reaching out to someone who doesn't know who you are up until that point. So there's an awareness uh, factor there, too. So I guess as opposed to uh, Ralph and LinkedIn have a very tight definition of cold calling, I have a, a broader definition of cold calling. For example, we work with a lot of clients that deal with a whole bunch of marketing leads. And if you talk to people who call and follow up on marketing leads, uh, trade show leads, webinar attendees, actually probably our webinar, Ken, some of your guys, it feels an awful lot like cold calling even though that person has taken some sort of action in the marketing space. So uh, for us, it's just about how do you make that connection with the person who didn't previously know who you are. So you're sort of saying, Steve, to you, cold calling is calling someone for the first time. 
I, that's it. I mean, and it could be could, could be cold emailing. It could be a cold um, outreach via LinkedIn. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But let's let's talk about the the, the technical yeah. definition that Ralph's talking about because cold is the issue. Meaning, yeah. do you really want to pick somebody, pick up a, a phone and call somebody you don't know anything about? You have no prior relationship, no introduction, no reference point. Would you dream of doing that, Steve? No. Uh, now, the, here's the interesting thing, is that this has evolved quite a bit from where it was before because of LinkedIn and because of other tools like that. And if you, if it, you know, at a purest level, if you're talking about cold calling as in, uh, you know, the guys in Boiler Room or, or Will Smith in that movie where he's a stockbroker and he tapes the phone to his hand, and like calls down a list of names and just says the same thing every single time. That's insanity. Um, doing it that way, that approach of brute force is absolutely completely dead. So I could not agree with that more. And you hear various pundits saying things like take the cold out of cold calling. I, 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 th that's exactly what has to happen. So if, if you do that, and, and don't get me wrong, there are people who do that out there and they make a living doing that. But if you look at that and A-B test their results on a list versus people who are finding relevancy and, and have a, a, an intelligent reason to connect, some sort of social connection preferably, um, the, the, the numbers are pretty significant. So we find, uh, for example, if you have a second degree connection versus no second degree connection, that your conversion rate of conversation to appointment goes from 32% to 50% once you have that second degree connection. That's cool. Yeah. Ralph, do yeah, you... Yeah, and I think that's, uh, yeah. that, that's one of the things, you know, I mean, one of the things that you brought up that uh, is, a, is a really good point, Steve, is this whole concept of you actually have a big separation between are you doing a reactive outreach or a proactive outreach, right? Because if there is, if there has been a download of an, of an e-book, a joining of a super exciting chat like this one, uh, uh, you know, or, or if, you know, or if they, they, they went and saw you at a booth, right? I mean, there's been a proactive outreach by the individual that says, hey, I'm interested in more information. So I think that is then, again, a different classification altogether, right? Because that is somewhere where somebody has said, hey, I want to know more information. I'm interested in this, in this conversation. I think that's a, that's a really important uh, differentiation. Ralph, can I jump in on that? Because this, this is an interesting phenomenon we're seeing with our clients, whereas before they were saying, go get us a meeting or an appointment. Now, in many cases, they're changing the offer sequence, and they're saying, go and, and, and make them aware of this great content and relevant content for them that they and their peers are getting a lot of value out of. So we're actually, in many cases, um, doing you know, outbound to introduce content first with the, with the goal, then, of, of nurturing and educating that person to a point where they become more sales-ready and do an appointment. Yeah. Well, Steve, do you see that that in in some respects that's then, you know, sort of an evolution of the competition we have for just uh, attention, right? Because it's kind of like we're trying to get that information out. So us on the marketing side, you know, we're using your website, we're using Twitter, we're using LinkedIn updates, we're using LinkedIn ads, we're using banner ads, we're using blogs. You know, the list keeps going, um, and. And I, I, th I think to a certain degree, there's also that information channel for us to push information out that we truly believe is a beneficial piece of information to, to that buyer. And I think that's another place then where we say, okay, well, you can't really do that cold because, number one, you'll have no credibility, and number two, you won't really know what's meaningful to that individual right now. So that's, again, where we say, hey, that's where you need to take a step back and say, okay, what kind of news, what kind of relevant topics do I have about this individual? What kind of relationships do I have that will get me an introduction that will give credibility to what I'm saying? You know, Ralph, uh, let's stay on this a little bit. You, I mean, you head up the marketing for the sales channel product of, of LinkedIn, and and, and you guys obviously have a plan that you're trying to, to drive this towards and where you, I mean, you've done a ton of homework. You, you see where the market's going. Describe for us sort of the boundaries. What, what's good proper use of LinkedIn? What are the things that, that really cause problem, that, that, that become spammy? You know, where, where, where's that boundary? Yeah. How does it work? Well, and that's, that's, a, that's a great question. I, mean, I think one uh, sort of um, answer that I usually give to that question too is uh, poor email techniques, poor 
cold calling, poor calling techniques, those kind of yes. things, yes. are amplified by tools like LinkedIn. So if you suck, you are going to suck tremendously <laughs> using LinkedIn, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, I think I think it becomes a matter of you know really uh, with the concept of keeping that buyer in mind and saying, okay, if I'm not doing something that I know. Uh, is going to be received as something beneficial in terms of I've read the updates by this individual, I know the groups that he belongs to or she belongs to and is commenting in, I have seen news and uh, gleaned, inf gleaned information about their company, I have a common uh, individual that can introduce me. I mean I think um, you know I can draw another hard line and uh, you know say anything that is not you being introduced to someone else by a common acquaintance, that's, you know, that, that's cold, right? And um, now, I, you know, that's, that's kind of where I would say, you know, really what you want to do, ideally, you always want to be on that line, so you're never really just going out and reaching out on your own. You're always going through somebody in your network that will make that introduction for you and bring you in with some credibility. What percentage of time, Ralph, would you say that happens in the sales world? The ideal? That's it's 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 hard to say. I know that uh, you know something that I do on the, on a regular basis. I probably do it on the average uh, once or twice a week for our sales team, cool. uh, where I'm introducing somebody. Uh, and part of that is also a growing as a company to have as a team. Uh, a way of working together and there's a synergy together of saying hey this is when I would introduce you this is where I feel comfortable introducing you because I think the sales team needs to be aware that just because they ask to be introduced doesn't give them some sort of inalienable right to be introduced yeah uh, and doesn't make it appropriate especially when you have uh, individuals like I think I think some of us here where our network probably is much larger because we're on the marketing side uh, of things and, and we use our network in a lot of different ways. People connect with us because they hear us speak or things like that versus other, one, other networks that, you know, we sort of say the rule of thumb is never connect with anyone unless you know that they know you well enough that they will connect you to one of their uh, acquaintances. Hmm. That's powerful. Can, you know, I, can, I, I, jump in, can, can yeah, I jump in here for a sec here? A couple interesting things, uh, Ralph, and I'll, I'll take a slightly more liberal but fairly similar view. So I, I, in a perfect world, you're doing it on, on, the, on social connection with that, that, uh, that actual connecting individual. Um, you find a lot of, of organizations, it's kind of ironic, it's like old farts like us who have the networks, we're not the guys that do the prospecting. It's it's the younger guys that do the prospecting, or people who maybe got into the business later and don't have the networks. And that's why I get excited about Team Link specifically because I've mm -hmm. seen it in use out there amongst our client base. Um, and now all of a sudden, you've got it opens up all the secondary connections to all of the old dudes like us, and you know guys and gals out there who have been in the business forever and have the connections. Because ultimately, Ralph, you're probably not going to be the person selling to your first degree connections, but in fact somebody else is going to be selling Navigator to, to those guys. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, and that, that's a lot of what we're trying to do, right, with, with some of the power that we're packing into Sales Navigator is to open up those networks uh, to all the individuals within a company so there's that transparency within a company that you can really maximize uh, that introduction and maximize the amount of times that that can happen, that you can take advantage of those opportunities. You know, one of the challenges, and, and we, I sort of throw that back at, at a question at you guys a little bit is, you know, uh, definitely a challenge is that a lot of um, inside sales, specifically inside sales representatives, are still being measured and they're targeted by volume. Mm. Where you know, I think I think it's hard for you know, systematically for people to say, okay, well, we really want to move more towards quality than quantity, but quantity is so much easier to uh, <laughs> to measure. But you can have both. Okay, Ken, I'm going to jump in, and then you're going to jump in. So you can have both. And that's where this idea of, of three by three research comes in, and I know you practice as well, Ken, which is you have to find something quickly because it is still, you do need a quantity, but you have to have something that's relevant to that company or that individual. 
and if you can bring in, I know that you had an executive change. We share a common group on LinkedIn, which we talked about. We, in fact, know that that is 70% better than if you don't share a common group on LinkedIn in terms of your conversion rates. So I, I, I believe you need a quality, or excuse me, a quantity of quality, and if you study people doing prospecting and cold calling work, uh, and, and you look, they find into one of two camps. They're either, number one, what we call the cowboys, and the cowboys are just shoot from the hips, ask question later. They never really think about what they're doing. And, and they get their numbers, don't get me wrong. And on the other side, you've got the librarians. And the librarians will research all day long two accounts and make exactly two phone calls and send two emails. Now, some librarians also make a great living because they sniper shoot so well that they're fine. But what we find is if you can make a, a best of breed person, call them informed cowboys, hey, now we've got something. And, the, and the, the central application, if you study informed cowboys, what they're doing is they're using LinkedIn. They're using LinkedIn for doing it and making it customer-centric and making it very helpful for that person and relevant for that individual. Well, and, and the thing that, I, that I've discovered in our own business, you know, we've been doing this now nine, ten years, and I've been in the industry for 23 years. The, the quality comes with the size of account quite often. And, and the caliber of the decision maker you're going after. The quantity usually is, is more based on, you know, smaller accounts, having to move more transaction base. You know, when we're going after enterprise accounts, we might be that librarian uh, just spending a ton of time trying to find the right information to get us into that specific decision maker. And I've said this before, and you can quote me again, there has never been a more powerful tool on the planet for that critical sales intelligence than LinkedIn. And it's primarily because it's self-maintained. And you guys have figured out a way to get the best decision makers in every industry, everywhere on the planet, to describe their own world, to tell their resume, to share their accomplishments, to interact, to network with their buddies. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about you know, how that came to be. What was the vision of LinkedIn, Ralph, when you guys kicked this thing off? I mean, the, the social network thing went crazy. You guys looked at recruiting you know, as an option, as marketing, information, sales as an option. And I know this new channel is actually not very new. The sales channel is, is really starting to kick in. But talk to us about, you know, how did you figure out what LinkedIn was going to be, and where did you start noticing the, the power of that this thing had? Well, that's that, that's a great question, and I can probably wax on that for about an hour or so. <laughs> but uh, I actually uh, just a few weeks ago had the opportunity to uh, be in a in a chat with uh, Reed Hoffman, one of the founders, right? And his vision really was this connecting the world's professionals uh, to create economic opportunity. Which just is, you know, it's, 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 and what that economic opportunity, it can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? It could mean that I'm a technologist or, and, and I'm looking to try something new or I've got a problem in terms of how I set up a certain uh, server room and, I'm, and, I, and I need to find somebody who's done something similar. Or it could be that I'm looking to hire somebody with some very specialized talents. Um, or it could be that I'm looking for, uh, for a prospect that has needs that really match up to, to my own. Um, so the idea is to really sort of build this community and this network that can help each other in ways. And I think that's why you get from me sort of this sort of visceral reaction of cold calling, right, reaching out to them, because it's, it's, it's sort of the, the, the concept is we're really bringing two parties together, right, that's, that's, that's mutually beneficial. And, you know, I, I, I think it's, it, it becomes a matter of, it does become a matter of a little bit of the definition of it, but it also is sort of that intent. And I think, I think that's something that really comes out, right? If my intent is to really create a mutually beneficial, meaningful relationship, there's no way I'm not going to see what relationships we potentially have, that we have a connection point, or like to Steve's point, do the three by three research that I can have a meaningful conversation with that individual, whether I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to sell them a, uh, you know, $39.99 toaster, or whether I'm selling them, you know, a $3 million, uh, you know, Caterpillar tractor or a new, uh, you know, 
uh, ERP system. I'm going to go through that due diligence to make sure I can have that meaningful conversation and engage in that in, 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 in sort of that meaningful dialogue. So, you know, I think to answer your question, probably the best, you know, answer that, that I can give you is, the, is that vision of, you know, cre using these relationships uh, to create economic opportunity uh, through these networks. You know, Jen, we're gonna... Jen, I'm about to jump out of my chair here. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just say, just for the format of the rest of the, of the, of the chat here, the Hangout, um, we've got about 10 minutes. We're going to keep these 30 minutes. So what I want to do is I want to, Steve, let's have you take some time on this. And then I, I don't want to get into, you know, if we all agree that the traditional definition of cold calling, that under that definition it's dead. But I want to, I want to get some how-tos. I want to make sure um, that our listeners get a chance to learn a cool, couple cool new things to take back with them. So when you're done responding, Steve, I want us to each take just a couple minutes and talk about the favorite ways they've found to use LinkedIn for warm calling, for relationship-based calling, for for that synergy you're talking about, Ralph. And Ralph, you've got a few insights and maybe even some cool directions that it's going. I think we'll probably end with you, but Steve, go ahead and, and take that and then just jump in when you're done into some of the coolest things you've seen lately. Yeah, absolutely. So can we do a, we do sales training for prospecting, qualifying, cold calling, social selling, those things, and in the course of our trainings, we do, we do the calling and we do the emailing and we do the research. And, and I just got back from Connecticut working with a very well-known research and advisory services firm there. Um, and I, here, they all ask the same question. They say, well, if we see that thing about that executive, that senior executive, that they put themselves on LinkedIn, should we say it? Should we use it? Isn't that, isn't that creepy? Isn't that big brother? And here's my, my, my response to them. I couldn't think of a senior executive on the planet who would prefer to receive a cold call versus prefer to receive a call from someone who's informed on their background, on their interests, on what they've done at other organizations. It's an entirely different thing. And I, get, I know, Ralph, I'm using the word cold calling here, but you get the idea. It's, yeah. So the answer is use it. Use it. And, and this gets back into that whole idea of connecting the world's professionals for, to create economic opportunity. There are people, and you guys get bombarded with a lot of solicitations too, as I do. There are people who do it the right way and people who do it the wrong way. And the people who do it the wrong way, I think, make a bad name for all of, all of the people in the cold calling world versus the people who do it the right way are doing exactly that. And if you look at some of the relationships, and actually, frankly, I'll give, you, I'll give you an interesting one. Bob Perkins, once upon a time, one of our guys cold called Bob Perkins, but it was a relevant call. There was a social connection, and there was something on with the American Association of Inside Sales Professionals. He's the president. I wouldn't be sitting here right now on this call having this conversation if it wasn't for that cold call. And, you know, it was a very relevant call. So let me get to the tactics here, Ken, of, of what, you, what you can do. The first thing is you need to form what we refer to as a hypothesis of need. And uh, not a lot of people do this. It's kind of a foreign concept. What about this person at this company or this hospital or this organization makes you believe that they might have a need for what you're selling? And, and that can come in a whole bunch of different formats. But if you don't have an answer to the question, why am I contacting this person and what potential needs do they have, don't do it. That's spam. It, when you do it, it's not spam, and it's a completely different experience. So I believe that fundamentally. Uh, you know, and I think that the second thing is how you use the information both on the internet and how you use the information on the phone. And we've gotten to this point where people are so dependent on just, I mean, if, Ralph, God love a read and LinkedIn because people are so addicted to LinkedIn uh, who sell that if it's shut off, they're in trouble. They haven't, uh, they haven't, they've sort of forgotten and the muscle has atrophied of how do you talk to an administrative assistant to get a little bit more information that the prospect happens to be traveling at a trade show and then when you connect with that prospect you can mention that trade show that you have in common. Um, so using the phone in conjunction with using the online resource is just a huge thing in forming that hypothesis of need. Okay, it sounds good. We have about five minutes left so we'll turn the time over to uh, Ralph here. Um, some thoughts, and then and then Ken. Well, you know, one of the things about uh, that that we've been talking about in terms of the the cold calling is, you know, also I think the 
uh, sales team should really look towards the marketing team and, and, and hold them accountable, right? And I say that as, as head of marketing where, you know, th my world has changed completely. What uh, we do here at LinkedIn is we in, have invested pretty heavily in terms of technology uh, to be able to clean information out of LinkedIn, out of the data that we have. Granted, we have access to you know a lot of data that other companies don't have access to, but we're also you know some of that we just combine the data that we have, for example, with with webinars, with content marketing, with activities that we have. So if you think about the the thing on the marketing side, what you can do to combine uh, explicit activities that the uh, prospects have done with sort of implicit knowledge that you have about who they are, where they are, and other other information that people can get from LinkedIn, uh, you start combining that with potentially reaching out to relationships and things like that, then you start giving your, 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 your callers and your salespeople a whole new way to, to research and, and, and develop the relationship and have that meaningful conversation rather than just calling up, right? So I think, I think the, the, the sales team should really sort of start pounding the fist on the marketing side. And if the marketing side isn't providing them some more of that intelligence, then uh, you know uh, you you really should look there to empower your your salespeople. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I I wanted to respond to uh, a couple of quick questions that just came in while we we got about three four minutes. Is that about right, Gabe? Yeah. So we have about yeah we can go for, for okay. five minutes. Correct. All right. And uh, one of them is why isn't there sales training out there that teach people how to make this connection? What, they're, what all sales training tends to do is they tell you what to do after you've made the connection, and our research shows the single biggest problem a salesperson faces is reaching busy decision makers and even knowing who they are. And, and uh, you know, that, that's one of the reasons I love, I love Steve's company is there's very few organizations that spend their training and their, and their knowledge on what to do to get the appointment, not what to do after you got it. That that world's been solved for 55 years. Um, so that's my my big question to the two of you is why isn't there more training on this, guys? Why doesn't anybody know how to do it? I don't know, but I'm glad there's not Ken because that leaves me living in a big <laughs> blue ocean. That's all I got to say. Now there are a few other people up here, like the Craig Clemens of the world and the John Barrows of the world, that have figured out different pieces of it and, and the Jill Conras, but. Um, yeah, no, the state of affairs for how do you get the uh, initial interest, attention, and an appointment if, uh, with a marketing lead or, or just without anything else is very, very minimal. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a great question. It's interesting because, you know, I sort of liken it somewhat to, uh, you know, one, probably one of the, uh, the most important gifts I got from my dad was, you know, by example, showing me how to talk to people and how to introduce myself and how to, you know, and it's sort of that, I think part of what we're talking about here is the difference if you're at a party and you start talking to people that you don't know and having a meaningful conversation, right? That's, it's sort of like, you know, cold partying. Um, we can go a whole different direction on that. But, uh, <laughs> But it's, it's sort of that same skill that you're saying, right? I mean, I think it's, it's a matter of some of the things that we're talking about is I think there's sort of this, this belief that inherently we should just know how to do this. Right. And, 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 and we don't, right? I think that's where the uh, sort of that quote-unquote cold calling that I have the visceral reaction to comes from is sort of leaving people to their own devices versus saying, hey, you know what, there is a, there is a very tactical way that you can do this that warms up the call so you can go and warm every time. You know, we, we just got a minute left. Um, if we could, I want to I wanna find the future here. This is a rare opportunity. Um, and, and Steve, maybe you can see you know, where you see it going. Ralph, I want to hear from both you guys. What are some of the next things that are happening in this world? Ralph, you guys rolled out the, the, the company analytics recently, and, and, and where is it about to go? I'm sure our, our, our listeners want to hear, what's next? 
Yeah. Well, I think it, you know, if I think about a quick timeline, a com conversations I've had around social selling, they went from a couple of years ago to a couple of mavericks here and there to, you know, a year ago being sort of, I'm going to do a trial here, I'm doing a pilot there, to now the conversations are all about, I'm rolling this out company wide, this is a must do, I'm infusing this concept into whatever methodology, name the methodology, that uh, the sales methodology that they use company-wide and bringing it in and I think that's where we're now seeing like the usage reporting that we brought out so you can track how are your sales reps utilizing LinkedIn for example so you can track and coach and start improving on how are you doing the uh, are you doing the, the social selling but I think the big driver is going to continue to be the buyer uh, and uh, you know I think as a as an industry we're starting to make that turn but uh, you know, and the the empowered buyer is going to start more and more defining this uh, this this journey that we take them on as as a, as a seller, and it's going to be all about how do we make a better buying experience. That's great, Steve. What do you see in the near future? Back to the future, and I got this. I'm stealing this a little bit from Gary Vaynerchuk. Think about the way selling was done in the '50s, communities. You know, people who had relevant connections with each other. How do you get business? You go to the Knights of Columbus. You go to the Eagles Club or whatever it might be. Um, and uh, you know, I think that online is is turning into that. Our parents are better prepared, or excuse me, our grandparents and great grandparents are better prepared in the future uh, with social media than than uh, I think a lot of salespeople today, uh, especially. And and I'm I'm a I'm a Gen Xer. I see a lot of Gen Xers and baby boomers who struggle who struggle with this stuff. So I see that you're going to see younger people who know how to embrace this and know how to take the information from marketing, LinkedIn, and other sources and use it to create really meaningful connections, almost like our great-grandparents did, are the ones that are going to excel versus the ones that are just going out there and spraying and praying. They're, going to, they're dinosaurs. They're done. Okay. Well, I think that our time's up. So thank you, everybody, so much. Uh, and any other words, Ken, before we wrap it up? You know, I uh, I was hoping our friend Steve Masters would join us today. The invitation still open, Steve, if you want to join us and talk about uh, LinkedIn and cold calling. But Ralph and Steve, you guys are awesome. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. We're going to start mm -hmm. doing this every Friday, guys. So so tune in, join us if you got. In fact, I think we can hold up to like nine people on the video and hundreds and hundreds of people tuning right. in. We're going to do our best to get to your questions. Yeah. Um, so this this is uh, Ken Crow and uh, President Founder of InsideSales.com. We've got a lot of fun things coming here mm -hmm. shortly. But thanks everybody for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Same uh, Inside Sales channel, same Inside Sales time. Correct. Same Hawaiian shirt. You're going to have the Hawaiian shirt on, Ken? <laughs> I, I have a different one for every every week. We'll leave. All right. <laughs> All Fantastic. you want to see which one you're wearing. All right. All right. All right. So uh, follow us on uh, InsideSales.com or Google Plus, and also Ken Krogh on Google Plus to stay up to date with the next uh, Ken, Hangout with Ken events. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. Have a good one.